All right. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm going to be going over week 4-1, part one of the cell cycle. Okay. Um, so here's your cell cycle. Um, some pretty general points about it. I'm going to go into each of these points in greater detail, so um, don't worry about that. The one point that I will talk about a little bit now is uh, G0. G0 is your cell's non-dividing state. Um, it's essentially when the cell is just being a cell and doing its thing, it doesn't want to replicate. Some cells stay indefinitely in G0, like uh, cardiac muscle cells, um, those don't replicate. Neurons don't replicate, red blood cells. Um, so it is possible for a cell to stay indefinitely in G0 and not enter the cycle at all. Um, of course, we're gonna be talking about the cycle anyway, so it's not really too relevant to us. It is possible, however, for some cells to uh, begin replication. So they go into G1 for a little bit, but then they might recognize that maybe there's not enough nutrients or it hasn't grown large enough. So then it might slip back into G0 while uh, it's getting all those things in order. So that's possible too, um, unless it reaches the point of no return, which again, I'll talk about that later. So G0 is just when the cell is being its cell and it's not considering dividing just yet. Okay, G1, uh, gap one or I, I prefer to view it as grow one because it just makes more sense. Um, so the cell decides that it's about time to start replicating or it's about time to go into G1 when it starts receiving the uh, growth factor signals. These signals signal to the cell that it should start going into G1 and it should, it should start considering entering the cell cycle. So in this point, it's checking to make sure that its DNA is okay. Obviously, you don't want to replicate a cell that has like super messed up DNA. So it's going to check its DNA real quick, make sure that that's okay. Um, it's going to check for G1 cyclin concentrations or cyclin D. I'll go into uh, more detail about what cyclin, what CDKs are in a little bit. Um, but for now, it's just checking for cyclin concentration. Um, it's checking for size. Obviously, if the cell is going to divide, it needs to be large enough to where um, it could divide and not look like a very puny cell. So it definitely needs to grow. It needs to check that it's uh, grown enough, that it has enough nutrients, energy. Um, and of course, G1 is where you'll find the uh, restriction points, um, or sorry, it's where you'll find the pre-replication complex, um, the pre-RC. Again, I'll talk about that in a little bit, um, but moreover, it is also the same place where you'll find the restriction point or the restriction checkpoint, whatever you wanna call it. It's called the start point in yeast. Um, but it's all the same. Essentially, this is like your point of no return. When the cell has uh, accepted or passed the restriction point, there's no going back from it. The cell can pause momentarily. It can, uh, so once it's past the point of no return uh, and it realizes that something is going wrong, like uh, the DNA isn't right or there's not enough, like whatever, it can pause in whatever uh, stage that it's in. But what it what it cannot do is go back entirely. Like it can't go back to G0 or something like that. Um, if it does pause for whatever reason and it stays paused for too long, it will most likely go into program cell death because um, again, it, it can't go back from the point of no return. Um, and if it's delaying, if for some reason the cell cycle is being delayed for a long time, it's probably because something horrible has happened. So it'll probably just um, uh, go into program cell death. Okay, S phase is your uh, synthesis phase. Um, this is where your genomic DNA starts being replicated. We're gonna have a whole like lesson on this. Um, yeah, so uh, we'll see you then. <laughs> G2, this is another growth phase. Um, oh, something I forgot to mention, each phase has different checkpoints, which is like I, mentioned before, the cell is periodically checking up in itself, making sure that everything is going okay, that it has the right substrates that it needs, that it has the right nutrients, energy, whatever. Those are called checkpoints. Um, I'll talk about those later, uh, but checkpoints exist periodically throughout the entire cell cycle, as you'll see in a little bit. G2, gap two, is another phase where the cell continues to grow. It makes sure that the DNA that it just synthesized right after the S phase is okay and that there's no damage. Um, and of course, it's checking for more cyclin concentration, probably for a different cyclin concentration. Again, I'll talk about what cyclin is, what CDKs are, what the different cyclin concentrations have to do with anything. Um, but yeah, that's G2. 
Uh, okay. M phase. Um, M phase actually has a bunch of different phases. I'm sure you've heard of them before. Um, there's prophase, metaphase, telophase, all that jazz. Um, so this is now where your uh, spindle assembly, your microtubule network that we talked about in the previous week, um, this is where all of that starts assembling. Um, of course, you probably know by now that during M phase, this is where chromosomes begin to segregate uh, because they're being pulled apart into two different daughter cells. Uh, and that all requires a whole microtubule network. So um, M phase is, is essentially just a bunch of spindle assemblies coming together for chromosome segregation, for instance. Um, the microtubule network is also maintaining the structural integrity of the cell so that it doesn't <laughs> like fall apart in itself. Um, again, we have more spindle assembly checkpoints, which we'll talk about in a previous, uh, ex excuse me, in a future uh, review from now. Okay. Okay, so here are your checkpoints. I promised that they came periodically throughout um, <laughs> throughout the cell cycle. And again, these are just for the cell to put a break when it's realizing that uh, something is going wrong. So uh, for instance, let's say during S phase, all of the DNA was synthesized, or excuse me, all of the genomic DNA was synthesized um, and everything is good. The cell is gonna go into G2 next, and it's going to reach this checkpoint where it's going to make sure that that DNA that was just synthesized was synthesized correctly, that there was no damages, um, and if everything checks out okay, it can continue. If something is wrong, like let's say there's, a, there's damage to the DNA, it's going to pause here for a while. So like I mentioned before, um, it's not uncommon for it to pause during a stage. However, if it pauses for too long, um, let's say there's like irreversible damage or there's just so much damage to the DNA that it cannot possibly continue anytime soon, um, the cell will just self-destruct. So a way that the cell stops itself from continuing, the molecular mechanisms for it to actually physically stop at these checkpoints um, almost always has to do with inhibiting CDK. So again, I know I haven't talked about CDK yet, but CDK is a cyclin dependent kinase. It's a kinase that pretty much gets the whole cell cycle thing going. So the way that the cell pauses at these checkpoints is by inhibiting CDK, the CDK complex, CDK with cyclin. Again, I'll get into that in a minute, but that's the role or that's how the cell cycle essentially gets paused by inhibiting CDK. And that's usually done with CDKIs, CDK inhibitors, I'll talk about this as well, I promise. Um, but that's your deal, okay. Okay, the restriction points. So I mentioned the restriction point um, is oftentimes called the point of no return, or I, I think Laura likes to call it the point of no return, but it makes a lot of sense because after you pass the restriction points, you can't go back from that. Um, your only option is completing the cell cycle or dying. Uh, what the restriction point is characterized as is, this RB E2F complex being dissociated. So RB, retinoblastoma, is this protein that's holding on to E2F with great affinity. E2F is a transcription factor. So its role is to go into the nucleus, um, start transcribing a bunch of proteins necessary for the cell cycle. Um, however, E2F, this transcription factor, cannot work it doesn't work because it is bound to RB. Um, the only way for RB to dissociate from E2F is through uh, is facilitated through a CDK. CDK is going to phosphorylate RB. When RB gets phosphorylated, then RB releases E2F and it allows it to transcribe all of these proteins needed for um, needed for the cell cycle. So the restriction point is characterized when RB releases E2F and when E2F starts transcribing all of the mRNA transcripts needed for these proteins. Okay, that's your restriction point. After RB dissociates, there's no going back from that. Oh, um, before I move on, um, you, you've probably come to this conclusion already. Um, a lot of cancers deal with mutations to RB. Um, where RB has an extremely low affinity to E2F that would allow a hyperactivity of E2F. And of course, that's essentially um, what cancer is characterized as. It's a um, overreactive or unnecessary proliferation of cells. Uh, again, so a lot of mutations with RB, so RB that cannot properly 
uh, restrain E2F is associated with a lot of cancers. Okay. Okay, the control system for the cell cycle. CDK, I promised that I talked about it. Okay, um, during the cell cycle, there's a bunch of proteins that need to be turned on and need to be turned off, uh, either with phosphorylating them or adding a inhibitory uh, phosphate. But in any event, all of those stuff or most of those things are carried out with this protein called, uh, or a kinase called a cyclin dependent kinase or a CDK. So this is uh, oftentimes considered like the master cell regulator. It's what's going to be phosphorylating a great deal of proteins necessary for the cell cycle. So that's why CDK is super important um, in this whole process. It needs to be carefully regulated because of course you don't want a hyperactive CDK. Hyperactive CDKs means um, a proliferation of cells, an unwanted proliferation of cells. Um, so it could be pretty bad if your CDK goes unregulated. So some ways to regulate it is by having to bind to cyclin. So CDK alone doesn't really do anything. CDK needs to be binded to another molecule called cyclin. I'll talk about that in the next slide. But again, CDK alone doesn't really do anything. Um, it needs to be bound to a different molecule. So that's one way to regulate CDK activity. CDK alone is really useless. You need to have cyclin around um, for it to actually perform anything. Uh, so one way to regulate it is uh, regulating the amount of cyclin. Um, another way to regulate it, so after CDK binds to cyclin, yeah, it's ready to start working, but it's not fully active. CDK and the cyclin complex become fully active and ready to start turning on proteins or turning off proteins when it is phosphorylated. And there's actually a protein that does this. And again, of course, I'll talk about that in a future slide. Um, so again, just to recap, CDK alone doesn't do anything. One way to regulate it is by regulating the concentrations of cyclin. Another way to regulate it is by um, whether or not you phosphorylate that CDK cyclin complex. And then finally, the last way to regulate your CDK is by introducing a CDKI or a CDK inhibitor, which of course, as the name implies, inhibits the CDK activity, which halts the cell cycle. Um, so CDKs, depending on what they're bind to, will target different substrates. So CDK bound to cyclin A targets some substrates. CDK bound to cyclin B targets different substrates. I'll show this in an illustration in a future slide, um, but that's essentially how CDK cyclin works. Okay. Um, okay, so cyclins. Again, much like CDK, cyclins are pretty much useless. They don't really do anything other than binding to CDK. Um, so cyclin, on the other hand, we talked about a different ways that CDK is regulated. You can inhibit it, you could phosphorylate it or not, you could have cyclin concentrations fluctuate. The only real way to regulate cyclin is whether or not to uh, transcribe it. So it's not like any cyclin specific inhibitors. It's just all about um, whether or not you produce cyclin or whether you don't. Um, it's all it's cyclin concentration dependent, essentially. Um, so like I mentioned before, the cell is going to produce the cyclin that they need during that point of the cell cycle. So the first part of the cell cycle, G1, it looks like the cell needs a lot of cyclin D and it, lead, it needs a lot of cyclin E. So like I said, cyclin is only regulated by transcribing that cyclin concentration. So in early G1, the cell is going to start transcribing a lot of cyclin D, and then shortly after it's gonna start transcribing a lot of cyclin E. But as you probably noticed, cyclin E, it, it looks like cyclin D stays um, in relatively high concentrations throughout the entire cell cycle. But if you just look at cyclin E, for instance, cyclin E looks like it's only necessary as the cell is transitioning from G1 to S phase. After S phase, like mid to late S phase, Cyclin E is no longer needed. It's no longer necessary. So through ubiquitin-mediated proteolysis, it's going to get rid of your cyclin concentrations. And of course, it's going to stop transcribing that cyclin. Um, so each cell cycle phase requires a specific cyclin. That is because the CDK, so CDK, there, there are different kinds of CDKs, but they're more general. Um, there's really, I, I think it's like CDK2 or something. There might be another CDK. There, there definitely is another CDK, <laughs> but they're definitely more general than cyclin. Um, 
So CDK must bind to a specific cyclin for it to target a specific protein in its specific phase. So there are specific proteins that need activation in G1 that are different from the proteins that need activation in S phase, which are different from the proteins that need activation in G2. So the only way for the CDK cyclin to activate these respective proteins is if that CDK is bound to its respective cyclin for that uh, particular phase of the cell cycle. That's why these cyclin concentrations are um, constantly rising and falling. So imagine that all of the cyclins are produced at high concentrations at the, throughout the entire cell cycle. What kind of consequences can you predict for that? You could pause if you want to, to um, kind of start speculating. I'm just going to go on with the answer. Um, imagine that your cell produced every single cyclin at uh, extremely high concentrations throughout the duration of the entire cell cycle. Well, now your CDK is going to be extremely confused. It's much more likely that your CDK is going to be binding to the wrong cyclins. Um, it's not going to be finding the appropriate cyclin that it needs for that particular um, uh, cell phase or cell cycle phase. Um, so that's going to lead to a lot of problems. If your CDK is binding to the wrong cyclin, it's going to be phosphorylating the wrong proteins, which can be pretty devastating. So it's really important that the cell um, not only regulates CDK cyclin activity, but also really regulates these cyclin concentrations. Okay. Okay, so like I mentioned, cyclin alone does nothing. CDK alone does nothing. Together, they are very powerful, but they need another step for it to be completely activated or to be inactivated. Um, so there's a few different proteins that we're gonna talk about. CAC, we won. This is a cyclin activating kinase. We won, um, it adds an inhibitory phosphate. And the way I like to remember we won is we is like small. It kind of like shrinks the activity of CDK. So we is small, it's shrinking your CDK activity. So it's inhibiting the CDK activity. Okay, so what happens is, um, like I mentioned, CDK cyclin alone need to be activated before they could actually do anything. So that CDK cyclin uh, complex is going to be activated with your CAC, with your cyclin activating complex. I Wait, I think that's what it stands for. Actually, I'm not sure if that's what it stands for, <laughs> so don't take me on that, but um, I, I think that's what it is, like 90% sure. But anyway, CDK cyclin is going to be activated by CAC. Once it's activated by CAC, it's gonna be going around, it's gonna be doing its thing, la la la, activating proteins, whatever. Um, again, let's say that the cell detects some kind of uh, DNA damage or detects that it's not grown enough, doesn't have enough nutrients, whatever. It needs to inhibit CDK from uh, phosphorylating more proteins. Um, so what it does is it sends we one to send that inhibitory phosphate to inhibit it. So this CAC protein adds your activating phosphate. CDK is going to be running around all over the place, phosphorylating whatever it can to proceed to the next step of the cell cycle. If the cell needs to spot, or excuse me, stop during a checkpoint, it's going to send we one to add that inhibitory phosphate. Okay, so that's when CDK activity stops. That's when the cell cycle halts. But let's say. Um, the DNA was repaired, or it finally got all the nutrients that it needed to, the cell finally grew to the right size that it needed to. Now you need to regain your CDK activity. Um, right now it's currently inhibited because we one added its inhibitory phosphate. So how do you regain this function? Well, you probably already guessed, it's probably, um, it has to release this inhibitory phosphate. And what does that is your uh, CDC25. CDC25 um, is another, activating phosphatase, or excuse me, it's another activating protein. It's an activating phosphatase, which removes the inhibitory phosphate. Once CDC25 removes the inhibitory phosphate, now all that you're left with is the activating phosphate. So now you once again have an active cyclin CDK complex. Sweet. Okay. Formation of the pre-RC. So again, this happens during... Um, this happens during the G1 phase. So the pre-RC stands for the pre-replication complex. Um, it needs to be done at low CDK levels. CDK is ultimately what's going to fire 
this complex. It's going. It's what's going to initiate it. Oops, sorry. It's what's going to initiate it. Um, so CDK needs to be in low concentrations. Otherwise, it's going to be firing unnecessarily, and you're going to have a bunch of origin of replications um, replicating. You're going to have a bunch of pre-RCs firing when you don't need it to fire. Uh, or in other words, it's going to fire prematurely. So the pre-RC is always formed in low levels of CDK or in low CDK concentration. Um, so what happens is, on the DNA, on the DNA, you have an origin of replication. That is where your ORC complex is going to bind to. ORC is then going to recruit a few other proteins, um, CDC6 and CDT1. Um, I don't think we need to go into like extreme detail about what these do. They're ATP aces. Um, I'll talk a little bit about why they're ATP aces and why that's relevant. Uh, but for now, all you, all that you need to know is that throughout the entire DNA, there's a bunch of different origin of replications. Your ORC is going to bind to that origin of replication. ORC is going to recruit CDC6, CDT1. These guys are then going to recruit another uh, protein couple, coupled pair called MCM. Um, there's two of them. This illustration doesn't really illustrate that, but there's two MCMs. Uh, I mentioned before that these are ATP aces. So when ATP is cleaved, hence uh, that's like the role, when ATP is cleaved, the MCM is fully loaded, locked and loaded into the DNA. MCM is a helicase. It's going to unwind the DNA and essentially like kick off cell division. Um, so once the ATP is hydrolyzed to ADP with the help of these guys, um, that is when MCM is going to be fully locked and loaded into the DNA, and it's going to be able to start um, uh, breaking apart the hydrogen bonds that's holding the DNA bound together. Okay, so that's your pre-RC complex. Um, the pre-RC complex, for it to continue, needs to be phosphorylated by CDK. Um, once the pre-RC is phosphorylated, once it's activated by CDK, it's going to start, it's going to go into the pre-IC, the pre-initiation complex where it recruits a whole bunch of other proteins and it starts doing you know, a bunch of other things. But again, we'll talk about that. Um, I believe we'll talk about that in 4-2 in the review this Friday, which Rachel will lead. Um, but just to once again, summarize the slide, um, CDK inhibits the formation of the pre-RC. So the pre-RC, the pre-replication complex happens at, at low CDK concentrations. So ORC is going to bind to the origin of replication. It's going to recruit these two proteins, CDC6, CDT1. These two proteins are going to recruit MCM. They're going to activate their AGPase activity. Um, sorry, I don't know what I just said. They're going to activate their ATPase activity, um, hydrolyze ATP into ADP, and that's going to lock and load MCM into the DNA and allow it to start um, breaking these hydrogen bonds. Once the pre-RC is phosphorylated with CDK, you're gonna move into the pre-IC, which again, we'll talk about in the Friday review. Okay, that is all I have for you. I'm gonna upload this soon. Um, I'll see you guys later. How do I stop this?